the headlines that we see every day. How often do the CNN or the newspaper or Seattle Times report on some new company that we've never heard of before having a breach and they've lost 150,000 records? Um, this happens with, with um, way too much frequency now. Um, the nightmare becomes reality and it's essential to have something in place so that when it does happen, you can react to it um, rather than being a bad Chinese fire drill. Um, now here's a thought question for you. If you were going to explain incidents response to a second grader, how would you describe it? I like to say that incidents response is like a fire drill for the IT person. That's how I would explain it to a second grader because second graders have to go through fire drills at their school. Um, and uh, here's a, a nice formal definition of what an incident response is. An incident response is an organized approach to addressing the aftermath of a security breach or attack. And notice what, is, what word is, is missing in there, the word computer or the word cyber. This, this could apply to a physical breach in your system. Um, there are lots of people that make a very good living doing what are called physical penetration testing. They want, they're, they're trying to get into your facility physically rather than through electronic means. And one of the best ways to do this is carry boxes of pizza or boxes of donuts, obscuring your badge, <clears throat> and walk up to the front door and people see, oh, pizza, donuts, come right on in. Yep. So, but this, this works for both computers and a physical breach too. Um, if you look at the documents on how to do incidents response, there are six steps in incidents response. Um, SANS, the security people, teach how to do this. The Department of Energy uses um, the NIST document, National Institutes for Standards and Technology. Used to be called the Bureau of Standards. Special Publication 800-61 describes incidents response. Um, that's pretty much what I live and die by in my job. It's a very good document. It is free. You can go out to the NIST site and download it, and there are hundreds of free documents that NIST has created for anybody to download, read, and use. So the, the information is out there. So what are, what are these six stages of incidents response? Pretty simple. Preparation, identification, containment, eradication, recovery, and lessons learned also sometimes called post-mortem. I don't think anybody uses that anymore because it's post-mortem means after death. People don't like to talk about that. Um, but those are the six steps in the NIST document and lots of other documents about how to do incidents response. Um, now, question for you. Where should you spend most of your time in these six stages of incidents response. <clears throat> Pardon? The first one. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Preparation is the most important step. That's where you should spend most of your time because the better prepared you are for an incident, the better you can do the other five. Now, it may seem like you are spending more time in the other five than in the first one, but uh, that's, that's the heat of battle, the fog of war. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about, about some of this. Now, <clears throat> you may consider this the academic version of the six stages of incidents response. What are the six stages of incidents response in the real world? They are these. <laughs> Denial. No, boss, we didn't have an incident or a breach. 
Further down. No, boss, I'm absolutely convinced we did not have any kind of breach or instance. Panic. Oh no, we've been breached. Ah! Extreme panic. OMG, we've been breached. Ah! We're gonna die. Finger pointing. Oh, well this happened because Fred over in accounting brought in this uh, USB drive with some software that he downloaded on the internet from home and brought it in and plugged it in and that had some malware that uh, went over to Charlotte over in uh, the CEO's office and got on her laptop and then it migrated to the CEO's laptop and then it created a command channel back to Russia and exfiltrated all of our Excel spreadsheets. The last one, resume writing. I'm getting out of here. I'm not going to put this on my resume, otherwise I'll never get a job again, except maybe down at Jiffy Loop. Um, that's, that's the real world of, of incidence response. Preparation, that's the first phase. This is where you actually get prepared for an incident. Um, Anybody seen the movie Live, Die, Repeat, the Tom Cruise movie, where he constantly recycles through um, the, the battle? Um, there is a line in there by S Master Sergeant Farrell that can sum up uh, the preparation part. Through readiness and discipline, we are masters of our fate. That is very true for, this, for preparation. And one of the things I like to point out, particularly to, to my management and other management, is that security is not a destination. You don't get to security and stop. It is a continuous process. It is a journey. It is not a destination because you're never going to be completely secure. There's always something new out there that's going to get in your way. The same thing for the preparation. It is a constant cycle. It, it's very much like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. When they, they start painting on the Golden Gate Bridge, they paint it all the way across, and by the time they finish, it's time to go back and start painting it again. So it's a continuous process. Um, preparation is a continuous process. Part of that process is making sure that when something new comes online, that you have hardened it and securitized it to prepare for an instant response. Reviewing your incidence response procedures needs to be done periodically, maybe no more than once a year. Um, one of the many steps in that preparation is creating some kind of removable media, like thumb drives or DVDs, that have good binaries for every kind of system that you have that you may need to do incidence response on. And this is one of the more fun things that you can do. Otherwise, it's just write, it's writing up documents and staging uh, mock incidents and stuff like that, which isn't a whole lot of fun for us system types. But uh, you know, making the removable media, getting that ready for when we actually have to do something, that's important. Um, it's just one of many steps. And we'll, I, that's part of, of the demo that we will see. Um, identification, that's the second step. We're trying to determine do we have an incident and whether or not the incident is something that we need to go further into. Um, I get, in, in, in my job, I see lots of stuff just bombarding my internet nose. And most of it is just trash. And a lot of it I've set up to just fall on the floor. Um, uh, uh, case in point, I see lots of stuff coming in from all over the world trying to get at my nodes through Telnet. Telnet. Telnet's older than dirt. Why are they trying Telnet? Well, two reasons. One is that there's tons of unsecured Telnet devices out there on the internet these days. Like, for instance, IOT devices. How do you communicate with them? Telnet. Telnet's easy. The other thing, banner grabbing. They connect to it, they get the banner 
from that I can do some a little bit of reconnaissance and see maybe what kind of system this is, uh, whether or not they've got some kind of warning banner, maybe determine what the OS is. But that, that kind of stuff, that just falls on the floor. I don't care about that. That's not something that interests me. So you need to ask some questions when you're doing the identification. Do we watch and learn or do we pull the plug? Old school, back in the 90s, yank the plug. We don't do that anymore. We don't just yank the plug and, and, and cut them off at the knees. A couple of reasons why. One, can we learn anything from this? The other thing is maybe the bad actor is being sharp and he's got some kind of command and control thing going on back out to um, Norway, for instance, beginning back to Norway. And if that program can't get back to Norway anymore, it does something like wipe your master boot record. Nasty. If you do watch, the question becomes, how long do we watch? Do we watch for an hour? Do we watch for a day? Do we try to gather some information like what IP addresses are they trying to talk to? What kind of data are they trying to exfiltrate? By what mechanism are they trying to exfiltrate? DNS is a favorite way to exfiltrate data on, on going out. Because everybody lets DNS go out. DNS request to figure out what, what hosts are mapping out there. HTTP. HTTP is a good one to exfiltrate data with. Because everybody lets HTTP out. The big question is, what's the risk of continuing operation if you have determined you've got a breach? Are they sending out valuable data, or are they just keeping in constant communication waiting for instructions? At this point, you want to collect volatile data. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But you want to collect data for future analysis. Uh, that might be volatile data, uh, stuff that's in memory, or the disk drives on the actual servers or workstations that are uh, being a part of the breach. Um, if you're going to, this is what we're going to be talking about. Did, was anybody in um, Alex Suarez's um, um, presentation yesterday about what to do in the first 30 minutes? Of a breach, yes. Okay, well this is, this is sort of the same thing, but this is a different take on it. Um, so you, you want to take your known good media, run the binaries on that known good media, and start collecting some data. Um, for instance, you want to get the date and time on the target. Are you in the same time zone? Some states are so big that they're in multiple time zones, like Texas. Texas is in two time zones. Some other states are in multiple time zones. Uh, Arizona. Arizona doesn't fool with daylight savings time. Um, computers are notoriously bad for keeping accurate time. That's why we have NTP. It is the system's time off from what you would expect. It may be that the bad actor has screwed around with the time to mask his his business. Um, so how can we find out what the date is? Just the date command. That's, that's easy. We want to know what version of the operating system and the kernel that's been timed and the kernel timestamp. The reason we want to know this is our, is the system running what we think it should be? It is not unusual for a bad actor to put a bogus kernel out there. That's why we want the timestamp of the build of the kernel. And we can get that really easy through, get all that information through the command uname-a. That will give us all of this information, the version, um, the build, all that good stuff. The network interfaces. We want to know, are there interfaces that we there that are there that we expect to be there. And what is the interface's state? It may be that our bad actor 
has reconfigured one of the interfaces to be in promiscuous mode. If it's in promiscuous mode, then it sees all the traffic that it can, and it may very well be that the system is not collecting that information and beaming that out to somewhere else. Um, just if config, dash A, that will tell us that. Um, network connections, this is very important. What other systems is the target system talking to? Are there suspicious local connections? It may be that your lo the system that you've discovered that is potentially breached has been pivoted to by another system in your network that shouldn't be. For instance, your main accounting server. Why is Jim from research and development, why is his laptop connected into your main accounting server? That's probably not a reasonable thing to be happening. External connections. What kind of external connections are there out there to the world? And suspicious open ports. Maybe there are ports that you shouldn't see. Like for instance, if you did a netstash-pan for show me the programs, show me everything, and don't try to do any name resolution. That will tell you all of this stuff. And the suspicious ports that are open will show up too. I like Netstat for, for kind of a funny reason. There's a lot of options in Netstat. And you can, there are so many options that you can spell words with it. Yeah. Um, the longest word I've been able to spell with the Netstat options and get something that actually is meaningful is planet. P-L-A-N-E-T. Those are all valid options for Netstat, and that will actually tell you real information. But I thought that was funny that you could actually spell a real word with all the options in Netstat. Um, okay. Peanut. Pardon? Peanut. Six. Peanut, yeah. Peanut's another good one. I've, I've not been able to find anything more than, more than six that, that does anything. Um, and and just, just as a side note, Netstat dash an works on both windows and linux they will tell you and it tells you almost exactly the same information in the same format how's that okay that's that dash pan that will tell you all of this stuff um open files what files are open and what processes have this open that's an easy one lsof ls open files and be prepared because that will just spit out lots of stuff. Running processes. Are there any suspicious open processes running? Is there something being run that shouldn't be? Most important, I think, are there system accounts that are not allowed to log in running shells? Um, if you were in my previous uh, presentation, we had a uh, bad actor who set up two system accounts that are not normally logged in to be able to log in. So if you're looking through your listing of um, running programs, which you can get, if you're, if you're a system five kind of guy, you do ps-ef, and that will show you all the stuff. If you came from the BSD background, if anybody remembers that BSD, PS-AUXWW. Just tell you more, more or less the same thing, but uh, either way, it tells you the running processes. Um, one thing that um, attackers can do is they can change the routing tables on a node so that where you think traffic is getting routed is not being uh, routed that way anymore. The route command will tell you that, or netstat-r will tell you the same thing. Are there suspicious file systems being mounted? Has somebody um, uh, mounted up something that you don't expect? Another one, cogenized kernel, kernel modules, rootkits. Have they loaded something on the system that is masking activity or potentially doing some other thing? Who is logged in? Uh, by the way, oh, mounted, mounted file systems. Just mount. Mount will tell you that. Um, LSMod, list the kernel modules. 
Users, who's logged in? What commands are they running? W. W will tell you that. Um, who's been logged in lately? Last. Last will tell you that. Um, have any suspicious accounts been added lately? Well, unfortunately, there's not really any one command that does this easily for you. Uh, the best you can do on this is just to cat Etsy password and Etsy shadow and look and just do manual inspection. But one of the things to look for is comparing the two. Should accounts that don't, shouldn't have passwords now have passwords? Have things been added at the bottom of either one of those files to create for the creation of new users? Um, is now, you, you theoretically should have only one and only one account that has user ID zero, GID zero. That's root. A frequent thing that bad actors like to do is that they will take another account and make those the GID and UID of that account so it's zero and GID zero. So that now, even though it may be a harmless looking named account, it's now got root privilege. So, you can do all of this on the, on the system that you're investigating, but why bother doing all of this typing? Why typing all of these commands? Um, why not script this? Because this is very scriptable. This is a very scriptable kind of thing. Um, now, here's a question for you. Um, I've got a thumb drive, and I stick it into my, this is, this is my known good binaries disk. Um, I stick it in, and I run, use those to uh, get good information about that system. Should I write data back to that known good USB drive? Nope. The temptation is really there um, to do that because it's there. It's got space on it. Why not write the results back to it? Well, there's, there's a couple of things why you shouldn't do that. One is that Linux tries to be nice to you. It will cache up writes to USB media, USB sticks in memory and not really write them out. You think it has, but it's telling you it has, but it really hasn't. It's when you try to disconnect that media that you find out that something's not right. And you sit there and you wait and you wait and you wait and you wait for the kernel to dump that information back out to that USB drive. Um, another reason not to is perhaps not so obvious. Um, if you are called in by, say, um, your legal department and your HR department to present your evidence about something, odds are the lawyer for, your car for the corporate is going to ask you a question like, well, this data that you collected, where was it stored? Oh, I stored it back on my USB drive that uh, I've got that I use for this kind of stuff. Uh, the lawyer says, have you used this USB drive before? Yes, I have. And you had data from another incident stored on there? Uh, yeah. How do you know that you haven't contaminated the evidence from a previous case onto this new case? Um, well, uh, let me get back to you on that. It makes you look bad. Um, if you really wanted to get around this kind of thing, you wouldn't use a USB stick at all. You'd use, you'd use write once DVDs. So there would be no uh, possibility of either the lawyer for your corporation or the lawyer for the defendant, if it comes to that, say, it was this stuff contaminated. Another possibility is to use NetCat as both a client and server to send the data that you're collecting across the network. And probably some of you 
a little light bulb's going on over your head, thinking, mm -hmm, okay, we'll, 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 we'll address that in a minute. Ah, okay. Time for the demo. Everybody watch CSI? Uh, yes, sir. Um, you mentioned uh, we should use a, a good trusted USB stick or a, a DVD. Um, but what are the um, best practices uh, as we have all our servers as virtual machines floating around? Um, I cannot. Uh, put a DVD into my virtual machine, you cannot, so what would you recommend in this such a case? Exactly, and I've, I've had to deal with the, this myself. Um, another possibility is that you have, um, you, you have set up something that you can mount via NFS to your virtual machines or a very large number of servers where it's impractical. And this is one of the things we'll talk about in a minute. Um, put your known good binaries on uh, an NFS share. And then when you get ready to do your analysis, mount that uh, NFS share to the machine that you want to investigate. Should I also um, have a checksum of my uh, NFS good binaries so that I can verify that they are still good? Um, that is a good possibility. Um, hopefully, uh, you have set things up so that it, this sort of thing is not common knowledge and that yeah, you, the bad actors don't see this out there. You don't have it mounted anywhere else unless you really need it, so it's not immediately obvious that that's there. Um, and, and talking about known good binaries, um, if you really, you, you can, there, there are any number of ways that you can take the distribution media and get the binaries off to some safe location. If you were really very persnickety about the whole thing, you would build static binaries for everything that you wanted and put those somewhere safe so that there would be absolutely no question that loadable kernel modules were not uh, interfering in some way. Um, I have I have gone that route once upon a time, and it's just too much work to keep it keep it all updated. Um, okay. Now let's see if I can make if we can make the magic work here. Uh, okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, this is my forensics workstation VM here. And um, I've got some scripts start created to facilitate this information gathering. Um, one of the things that's important in doing this, and it seems trivial, is picking a name for a case that you're investigating. And this could be anything. Um, I like to use the word case in, in my names. Um, what I'm going to do is execute that shell script, start case. It's going to um, open a case 
and create some ports that are going to be open so that my client, the infected machine, potentially infected machine, is going to gather data and send it back to. And this is all using Netcat as both a client and server. NC, Netcat, same thing. Okay. Just to make sure. Okay, oops. Ah, so let's call this case and uh, Linux Fest Northwest and what this is going to do is this is going to create a case and start my listener over here for the data and I'm going to give this name that I like the word use the word case because that identifies that it is a case and something that's meaningful and that business there at the end that says execute the date command with a format of year dash month dash date in it so that I know when this actually occurred okay great now Let's hope the demo gods are doing the okay here. I actually have a USB with no good binaries on it. And I'm going to plug that in here. And, wow, how about that? That actually worked. I'm impressed. I am just so impressed. I tried this before and it didn't work. Yeah, I forgot. I, I'm getting ahead of myself. I need to do this. And yes. I am so impressed. Yep. It's amazing when it's amazing when you can get a USB plugged into a physical machine to show up on a virtual machine. That's that's real magic. That's real magic there. Okay. all my stuff. I've copied bin, lib, lib64, sbin, and user directories, and I've got scripts that are going to do stuff for me. Now, the first thing I want to do, now that I've got the media actually mounted, is I want to start up a good version of bash. I don't want to use a potentially contaminated bash. So, what I do is I execute I do exec bin bash. Now I've got a better version of bash running that I know about. Now I've done a little bit of stuff here so that I don't have to do a lot of typing. How do you know you have a good version of exec? Pardon? Um, well, exec, <sighs> you just hope, <laughs> you, you gotta, 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 you gotta,
Um, well, in libc, etc. <coughs> Pardon? Do you have libc in the in, in your, on your flash drive or? In? Yes. Okay. That's that's in there too. All right. That's all in there. Um, what this is doing is I'm now setting my path variable to be the libraries that I have on my known good media. And when you built all this, you used our paths that, that ignore what LD library path and so Well, actually, that's the next step. Um, now, like I said, if I really wanted to be really persnickety about this, um, I would use nothing but um, static binaries. But that's, like I said, that's a lot of work. Um, and that kind of depends on, on your situation. Okay. Now I should be in relatively good shape. I've got a version of Bash that I have reasonable faith in. I've got my library set up to the ones that are on my known good media. I've got my library path set up so that I'm good there. And I run a little shell script that gets everything set up so that it can now talk back to my other, um, uh, my listener on my forensics machine. And I have a shell script to do all of that stuff that I was talking about with the various commands. And let's see. I've forgotten what the IP address is of my other system because it has to know who to send it back to. Uh, Ten point zero point two point fifteen. Good. Bad typing. What? Hmm. Bad typing strikes again. I've often wondered why they put the caps lock key next to the A when you have to type A so many times. Okay. I don't know what I would do if I didn't have command recall. How did we live without command recall before today? Um, yeah. 
shucks. Gods aren't aren't happy with me today. I worked so well yesterday. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I've forgotten what my own, what my own stuff is supposed to do. Don't do source that. Yep. Okay, D D D. Okay. 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 Two dot fifteen. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. I apologize, the demo gods are not happy with me today. I beg your pardon? Oh. <clears throat> yeah, 10 dot. Bad typing strikes again. Mm. Why is that not happy? Take the easy way out here. Ten dot zero to fifteen and hmm, that's interesting. Trying to gather information and uh, badness pops up. Well, at a high level, what's it trying to do? Pardon? At a high level, what are you trying to do? Um, all those commands that I showed, I'm trying to gather that information back to my forensic workstation rather than try to type them in to try to automate this a little bit. And, uh, yeehaw. Ah, well, a lot of things didn't work for some odd reason or the other. Uh, is this machine potentially compromised? Probably. Okay, let's see. Let's go back over to our forensic workstation. May I, while you're talking, you mentioned NFS. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend it because if the NFS server is compromised, your NFS file system can be shared without you knowing it by somebody yeah. else. Yeah, there's, there's problems with all of this. And it depends on how much risk are you willing to put up with. Okay. Uh, let's do close case, shut everything off, and let's cd to our case directory. And do we have something? Uh, 
Yes, we've got something. We have a log file. Okay. How about that? I'm impressed. It actually did work. <clears throat> okay. We've got the time and date. And we also have up here the time and date that we executed the command. Um, the command that we sent, we sent uname a This tells us what version of the kernel and it's Ubuntu and what the timestamp on the kernel was. We now know something about our interfaces. Like for instance, it's up. Promiscuous mode is not on. That's good. Um, now this is interesting. I tried a netset a and p and that didn't list any connections. That's kind of weird. Um, I tried doing an LSOF and that didn't work. Is this starting to look like this machine's been compromised? Probably. Um, PS-EF, I can go through here and I can look and see if there's anything unusual. Um, any processes or uh, logins that I'm not familiar with. Um, my netstat dash route. Okay, that worked. That much at least of the network we can know about, and that is the correct router. Um, I'm looking at the routing table with the route command. That works. Um, everybody kind of familiar with this thing called dev shim, SHM, shared memory. It's a shared memory segment. It's a pseudo file system that exists. <coughs> I like to test this because I have used dev shim as a place to hide stuff. And I showed, I've shown this to people and they've taken to that and they've started using that as a place to hide stuff. Since I know it's a place where I like to hide stuff, I check to see if somebody else has tried to hide stuff there. So it, that's, that's just normal stuff there. Um, LS mod, have I got unusual kernel modules in there? Um, doesn't really look like it. Um, looking at my disks, what disks are mounted? Does anything look unusual there? What disks are mounted, that looks all reasonably interesting good. This is my USB drive down here. Um, who's logged in? John is logged in. That seems to be okay. Um, the log of who has logged in recently. Um, Debbie Temp. Well, that kind of looks a little bizarre. There should be more entries there. Uh, bad logins. Okay, well, if you since these presentations are in reverse order, we would know. We would look at this and go, "Eh, this is kind of weird." Because why should LightDM be trying to log in? But that's because these things are out of order. Um, looking at our Etsy password, nothing particularly unusual there, but hmm, this is kind of weird. Why is there this username John N down there at the bottom? That kind of looks suspicious. Looking at our shadow file, well there's root. root. Root is prevented from logging in. Hmm, <clears throat> this is kind of weird. Whoopsie, whoopsie's a system process. Why does it have a password? That's, that's not good. Same thing for LightDM. LightDM has a password. That's the display manager. Why would somebody want to log in through the display manager? So this machine is starting to look more and more like it's been compromised in some way. Um, now here I'm using a 
program called Unhide. Unhide does some interesting stuff in looking, it looks at um, tables inside the kernel in unusual ways and hopefully find some interesting stuff. Um, <clears throat> like for instance, why do we have these ports open? These are not normal ports that are open for this machine. This is why we got um, all of those kill processes because it's trying to it's found, now this is kind of weird, all of these ports that are not normally open are open and it found them. And the fact that when we ran netstat, we didn't get anything. There was nothing there. Something has definitely compromised this machine and we need to do further analysis on it, which was what I did in the first talk I did. Okay, that's the end of the demo. So we have, we have good evidence now collected that, yes indeed, we've got a compromised machine here and we need to do more investigation. So yes, we, we do have an incident here. And let's go back to our slideshow and start from there. Okay, the CSI effect. Um, a couple of improvements that we could do on our script. Uh, we could search for rootkits specifically. There are two really good programs for looking for rootkit. There's Check Rootkit, there's the URL, and the other one is RK Hunter. They both look for in, in, what are called IOCs, indicators of compromise, because rootkits frequently leave some kind of footprint that indicates they have been there. Um, there is a nice open source program called Linux Enum. And it does a very good job of looking at process tables and looking for possibilities of escalation of privileges beyond what's normal to root. Uh, you could uh, improve the script by doing by using any of these programs. Um, now, what's wrong with this picture? I'm using netcat to send the stuff across the network of the interesting data I'm interested in collecting. What's netcat going to do? It's going to send it in the clear, right? There's no encryption there. What if my bad actor is sniffing the network and he sees all of this forensic data going across? Is he going to be happy? Probably not. What could you do to do, to, uh, do something about this? Well. The guy who writes nmap writes a special version of netcat. And it actually will allow you to use encrypted channels. It has the, the stuff built in so that you can create an, a, a client and server that exchange some built-in certificates so that they can talk in encrypted traffic and you don't have to worry about this. Now, this might be great for a single system or maybe two. When you're starting to look at, say, three systems, it starts getting to be a bit of a hassle. What if you've got <clears throat> 10 systems that you need to look at? What happens if you've got multiple distributions running in your environment? You've got a couple of versions of Ubuntu. You've got a couple of versions of Red Hat. You've got some Fedora. Maybe you've got some Arc Linux. Maybe you even have Slackware. That ends up being a lot of these USB drives. That ends up being a lot of maintenance that you have to do to keep them all up to date, especially when patches come out. What happens if you have a suspected breach and it's in Frankfurt, Johannesburg, Bangkok? Well, I hope your passport's up to date. This doesn't this is a nice approach. The general idea is great, but it doesn't scale well. <clears throat> now, Google, how many systems does Google have out there in the world? Who knows? Maybe not even Google knows. But they have this problem, and they've already solved the problem. And they're making their solution 
available to the world. It's called Google Rapid Response. Google Rapid Response is a incidence response framework for doing live forensics. Just go out there and Google for Google Rapid Response or GRR. Grr. It's a client server architecture. There is a client on every one of their machines out there. There's this nice web uh, interface to it. If the system is up and on the network, the Google network, they can get to it. They can drill down into it. They can pull out artifacts. They can look at live memory dumps. There are agents available for Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. If you've got a IBM mainframe, you're out of luck, but that's a different story. It's free. Google has solved this problem for you. Check it out there. Um, some references on instance response. I mentioned the NIST special publication. It's a PDF. Uh, you can download it. It's free. Um, Information Security School has stuff on instance response. SANS has these wonderful incidence response forms on how to respond to a, 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 an incident. Um, again, another NIST document, special publication 800-86. Uh, All special publications start at 800 for some reason. This is how you can integrate forensic techniques into your incidence response plan. And here's my email. And how are we doing for time? Not too bad. Questions? Plenty. Yes, sir. Um, so uh, some uh, vulnerabilities exist in the USB drivers. Mm -hmm. and, um, if you use a USB key in more than one computer, you could potentially compromise a computer that's not the target. Yes. And uh, the um, USB keys used to, some of them used to have dip switches back when they were like 128 megs and you could write lock them? Oh yes, so, yeah. Do you know if any modern USB keys have that and where to get them? Because I've been unable to find them. Um, I have forgotten the name of it, but there is actually a company that makes a USB that has that you have to enter a code on the USB to be able to use it. So it's a very secure USB. Is it cost competitive? Of course not. You get an SD card. Those uh, those you, you, get of USB course it's not card. cost competitive. It's, the old, the old, like, yeah. it's, it's not, it's, it's it's not so cost competitive at all because if you're interested in that level of security, you'll pay whatever they charge. And it doesn't matter because, and they have, they have staked out a very uh, important niche market by having a very secure USB that you've got to enter some kind of code on to be able to use it, like government agencies. Three-letter government agencies that maybe start with N and end with A. So you could get you could read access to the USB key, but not write access via codes. Um, I haven't looked into it that much. Because when you when you plug into an infected sure. computer, you don't want that computer to be no. able to compromise. No, USB. and uh, you don't want it to be able to do that. And one, of course, I didn't do this. Uh, you can always mount that USB as being read-only. Um, but. Yeah. That's still trusting the that's infected. Still, that's still trusting the infected machine, and they could, you know, yeah, there, there's, the you, you can, you can get into a tremendous rat hole on this kind of thing, uh, and that's, uh, that's how, and that all goes back to how much risk are you willing to accept? That, that's something. Uh, this gentleman back here. I had think uh, India might uh, approach my team to use an um, SD card because SD cards still have write protection and you could use a USB card reader and the write protected SD card. Because I also think that the um, code protected USB drives are especially protected against um, malicious reading of the data. So, and if you have entered the code, I think they are decrypted and you can also write. 
Yeah. Um, you had a question. Yes. Um, I don't know if you looked at this Google response, but since that's a client, um, if that's an agent on the client, it might possibly be compromised as well. That's certainly a possibility. Mm -hmm. Again, that goes back to how much risk are you willing to accept. Wouldn't the art of just plugging USB drive and potentially not, or alert that something's going on in the system and everything that's on the system? Oh yes, that, that, that is the problem. And that is the problem with doing any kind of live response. Um, you might trigger something. Um, just the act of plugging in a, a USB drive, that's going to change slash Etsy MTAP, the mount tab file. And your, your goal when you're, I didn't mention this and I should have, the goal when you're doing a live response is to minimize the disruption to the system as much as you possibly can. That's why um, you, you, that's one of the suggestions I made about using a DVD rather than USBs, because you can't write back to it. But then you have other problems because you gotta pack around a DVD drive if it doesn't have one and all this kind of hassle. But that's the, that is your goal when you're doing live response is to do as little to the system as you possibly can and get the information off as fast as you can. Because you may, it may be that you have to make a determination of they're, they're getting all of our, they're, they're shipping all of our intellectual property off to the Falkland Islands. We need to cut the cord real quick. Or they're just sitting there, they're not doing anything. Let's watch them for a little while and see what they're where they're, what they're trying to do. And that's generally not the decision that the incident responder makes. That's something that management's got to make. That's their decision. And you, you don't want to be the one making that decision. You want to push that off into management because if it ends up being a bad decision, you just lose your job. They go to prison. Other questions? Okay, well, lunch. Thank you. Thank you for coming.